Okay, so now I'm going to talk about Schaffer's objection, Jerome Schaffer's objection. I'm going to try and represent this as an argument. <coughs> Premise one, if there's an identity relationship, and this means it's an is relationship, right? The is relationship is a relationship of identity. If I say Borat is Sasha Baron Cohen, um, I'm expressing an identity between them, that they're, they're, they're really the same person. If I say the morning star is rocky planet Venus, I'm saying there's an identity between them, that um, they're, they're, they're really the same thing in some sense. Now what that actually means kind of needs to be unpacked, but I'll, I'll do that later. So Schaffer says if there's an identity relationship, between two objects, right? The morning star is an object, rocky planet Venus, the big ball of rock that we call planet Venus, is an object, right? There's, the object kind of means two, something we think about, something we can define in some way. And sometimes two objects are the same object, and sometimes two objects are different objects. Does that make sense? Right. So if there's an identity relationship between objects, everything that can truly be said of either one can just as truly be said of the other. So Schaffer says that if the morning star is Venus, and we say that Venus is 65 million miles from the sun, that's probably wrong, but it's a guess. If, if, the, if the planet Venus is 65 million miles from the sun, we ought to be able to say just as truly the morning star is 65 million miles from the sun. And if the morning star is just seen in the morning, we should be able to just to say that planet Venus is only seen in the morning. Okay, go on. I'm going to just go on. He, he says, right, if you, everything you can truly say of one thing can just as truly be said of the other. Um, Schaffer says that things that are true of 
brain of, of mental events are not true of brain events and vice versa. So every mental, every brain event has a certain shape, progress, and pattern. So if we take the brain, so let's so say this is the limbic system. This is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, I'll just call it the frontal. And this is the cerebellum. You guys know what the cerebellum is? If you, if you look at a, at a brain, it looks like it's got another little small brain hidden at the back like a spare. Right? If the main brain doesn't open, you, you use the spare brain. Um, do you guys know what that little, bra little brain does? It's actually got more neurons in it than the main brain. It's a cerebellum, and it handles fine motor control. It, it's, you know, that I'm moving like this, right? Well, my cerebellum is working very hard right now. Oh, I feel good. Yeah, that's kind of good. I like that. Uh, my cerebellum is working overtime to accomplish that, because it's the cerebellum that generates the detailed commands to make your body do complicated things. Right. So, um, right. um, but there's also the limbic system, which handles arousal, the fight, fight, arr, stuff. You know, it's arr, or, ah, the uh, or ah, reflex. And there's the frontal lobe, which is active now because I'm trying to figure out what to say next, right, how to explain stuff, um, checking to see if the, visa, the, the camera's still working, and so on, right? I'm doing, this is doing the logical, conceptual stuff. This thing is, ooh, it's hot. I'm kidding, it, it doesn't feel any different. Um, all right, so, um, so you can imagine, right? doing a little dance, and then working out a logic problem in your head. I was faking it, I didn't, I couldn't, you know, extra thinking, more work. But I'm pretending, right? If I was actually working out a logic problem. Okay, so I've got two thoughts, the logic problem thought, and the do the dance thought. Right, well the logic problem, according to brain science, the logic problem thought happened here, and the uh, do the dance thought happened here. But they didn't feel like that. I didn't feel like there's a thought happening here, and then, oh, I'll do a dance happens somewhere. Actually, it feels like it happens in, you know, in, in my body, but, um, right? It doesn't feel like it's happening in a different part of my brain. Um, when you do something holistic or creative, like you're drawing, <coughs> painting a picture, or, or um, I don't know, arranging blocks to make a pretty, arranging flowers, something you're doing that, that, that uh, relies heavily on your aesthetic sense and creativity, uh, for most people, that's the right side of the brain activity, right? right? You're not really thinking in terms of words, you're thinking of what looks good and, and what seems harmonious to you and what seems to fit. So you're, like, you're in art class. When you do math, or philosophy, or anything that requires logic, requires to, to evaluate arguments, or draw inferences, or work out which inferences you can draw, and which ones you can't, what's valid and invalid, right? if you're in a symbolic logic class, that generally happens on the uh, left side of the brain, particularly in the areas associated with language, which don't just handle language, they handle analytic skills as well, organizing things, and arranging things, and, and, and putting things into words, too. Right? You have this the line of you have thoughts that are expressed in words inside your head, right? And there are other thoughts that don't get expressed in, in words. 
you know what you're thinking, but you don't, your mind, brain doesn't go all the way to put it in words. So these things happen in different areas of the brain, right? Painting the painting happens over here. Um, solving, the, solving the math problem happens over here. Do you ever feel like, oh, wow, well, yeah, wow, this, this thing is really going over here. I must be painting, this must be a good painting. And then, oh, I've got to do a math problem. Whoop, all the activity rushes to the other side of my brain. Whoa. You know, like, it's, uh, never mind. Whoa. <coughs> yes? What happens to the brain when you're stressed out? Uh, limbic system kicks in. Stress activates the limbic system. And uh, that pushes adrenaline. And you get more fight or flight. And when you're stressed, it's harder to think. Right? And so, um, and actually, um, a long time ago, uh, I took yoga and I studied creative visualization and all this Eastern stuff and I thought very strongly about stress and I tried to cultivate mental habits of letting stuff go. Right? And the certain kinds of stress I can deal with very, very, very well, or at least it feels like it well. I'm teaching eight classes in four colleges. I feel good. I feel okay. I'm tired. But I generally don't think stress, feel stressed. I mean, not all the time. I have to take breaks and relieve stress. But, but um, most of the time I'm pretty calm because I work at controlling how I think and dealing with low self-esteem. I work at controlling how I think. Um, but what happens to the brain when you're stressed? Limbic system, more adrenaline, um, depressed, Co uh, cortical activity, um, I think maybe some enhanced cerebral, uh, cerebellum activity, but I'm not sure. Um, that's, that's the extent of my knowledge. There's more changes <coughs> that I don't know about. So, but do you feel like your, your brain is working in a different things when you do different thoughts? I have the thought of, I look pretty bad on camera, all right? Um, or I have the thought of, of looking at that little, the little red wreck thing there to make sure that the camera's in. And I see that and I recognize red. Okay, I recognize it's red and it says wreck. So, yeah, I just did it again. Um, there's a set of neurons in my brain that fire in a certain pattern to do that. There's some circuits activated. And let's say it has this shape. Does it feel like it has this shape to me? Does the thought have the shape? Thoughts don't have shape. Brain events have shape. Thoughts don't really feel like they're located. They feel like they're, I, I mean, they feel like they're behind my eyes, and that's about it. But thinking creatively doesn't feel like it's on this side of the head, even though that's where the brain activity is. Thinking logically doesn't feel like it's over here, although that's where my theory says it is. So there are things you can say about brain events you can't say about mental events. And, you know, if you have someone, the top of your head cut off, and they're showing cameras, they've got cameras, so they have cameras working inside your, your brain, and you think red, real red, lots of red stuff all at once, your brain doesn't turn red. And in fact, it's, you know, visually, nothing changes, because it's all electrical. So Schaffer says... There are things that are true of mental events and not true of associated brain events, and vice versa. <coughs> so there's a contradiction between these two things. If there's an identity relationship, everything that's true of one object must be true of the object that it is, and vice versa. But it's not. You can't say this about brain events. Conclusion, now I put wrong in parenthesis because Schaffer doesn't say this, at least not as reported as by Palmer. Palmer says, Schaffer thinks that this renders mind-brain identity theory absurd. And then he says, 
it's difficult to evaluate <coughs> Shaffer's objection. And I disagree with both of those. Right. In logic, the term absurd means a self-contradiction. Nothing, you remember um, Hume, we talk about married bachelors, square circles. A married bachelor is literally an absurd concept because it's a self-contradictory concept. A square circle is an absurd concept because it's literally, not metaphorically, literally self-contradictory. <coughs> so if my brain identity theory is really self-contradictory, then it's got to be false. But notice, self-contradiction is something that happens between concepts. It's not something that happens in evidence. I actually don't notice that. I don't, that's not relevant. I have no idea why I said that, where that would go. That was me having a bad idea. All right, so let's look at this and try to have a good idea about it. Right. Now, it's certainly true that you can say things about brain events that you can't say about the associated mental event. You can say they have a certain shape. Thoughts don't have shape. At least they don't feel like they have shape. Brain events do, but thoughts don't. Um, I can have a thought with an associated sense of urgency, an urgent thought, or a sudden thought. And that's kind of, kind of, well, urgency is the limbic system activating, the thought is stuff. But still, it doesn't look like it's an urgent thought. I mean, what would be urgent about it? A thought of a green object is not green in the brain. There isn't a part of the brain that flashes green. Now, I said, this is, I said that this argument is wrong, and I think that it is wrong. And I want to try and explain what I think is wrong about it. Here's the claim. I've noticed something about bad arguments in philosophy. The part of the argument that you're expected to take for granted is usually the part that's wrong. The part of the argument where there's an assumption that you're supposed to share is usually the part that you should challenge. It's usually the thing that doesn't stand up to analysis. If you remember um, justified true belief, and we have, look, there's this belief, it's justified, and it's true. And we got the belief from evidence, because we like it by hypothesis. You know, people have beliefs, and there's justifications. But what, what makes it true? Oh, we just assume that it's true. Right? In, every, in just about every other philo philosophy classroom, when they talk about justified true belief, they'll say, well, here's a true belief. He has a just, here's a true Here's a, here's a belief that's justified, and it's true, so it's justified true belief, and that's not a problem. But if you ask, well, what makes this true? Why is it true? Oh, we're just assuming it's true. And you say, well, don't do that. If we don't, how can we assume that it's true? Let's talk about real life. If, if I say, that's my Uncle Bill, or if I say, that's a horse, how do we tell that it's not? Let's, we, we just assume it's a horse. You can't just assume stuff. You have to have a justification for believing it. You have to have a reason to believe it. And in justified true belief, truth turns out to be the same thing as either justification or belief, depending on who's saying what and how they're using the word. Where's the problem? Well, here's the problem. Schaeffer says that if there's an identity relationship between something, if you say that two things, if you say that one thing is the other thing, everything that can be truly said of either <coughs> one can just as truly be said of the other. Is this true? Well, if I give you two names, all right, you have a, a, a nickname? Um, right, well, I, I know people with nicknames. Uh, uh, 
I have a friend called Spike, whose uh, legal name is uh, Kenneth Dodds. He's also known as Kenny. And if I say Spike is Kenny, right, and, um, everything I can say about Spike, I can also say about Kenny, right? Um, Kenny's in the kitchen. Where's Spike? Well, Spike's in the kitchen because Spike is Kenny. Oh, right. And usually you do something like that when people, you're introducing someone he uses two names, and you go, oh, that's... Have you ever had that happen, where somebody's got two names, or, or someone's talking about someone else, and they use two different names, and you don't know it's the same person? And then afterwards they say, oh, no, that's the same person, because they just have two names. Yeah, and it's annoying, isn't it? Right. But that's not the only situation where we use the word is, is it? Right? We say things like, Borat is Sasha Baron Cohen. Right? And there's this difference between sense and, re and reference. If you, ask me, if you ask me, who is Borat, there's two kinds of answers that I can give. I can give you the sense, or I can give you the reference. If you say, who is Borat, and I say, well, he's an incompetent, racist, ignorant TV presenter from Kazakhstan who has bad hair and, wear, uh, and a bad suit. Um, you can say, no, 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 I meant who's the actor? Oh, oh, Sasha Baron Cohen. The sense of Borat is the description, the, the, the racist, uh, Kazakh, <coughs> idiotic Kazakhstani TV presenter. <coughs> But the reference is Sasha Baron Cohen, the Jewish guy from South England. I think maybe he's from Staines. Or, or, it seems like a lot of that. I don't know all that much about him. Um, so there's this Jewish actor, there's this Kazakhstani TV presenter. They're the same person. Or rather, one is an imaginary person portrayed by the real actor. Is it true that everything we can say about Borat, we can just as truly say of Sasha Baron Cohen? What country is Borat from? Kazakhstan. What country is Sasha Baron Cohen from? He's from England. He's British. Um, what does Borat do for a living? He's a TV presenter. What is Sasha Baron Cohen doing? He's an actor. Is Borat married? I have no idea who, if Borat's married, but you know, ask about Borat's family, you'll get a different answer when you, from what you get if you ask about Sasha Baron Cohen's family. So it's not true that everything we can say about Borat, we can say about Sasha Baron Cohen. All right, suppose somebody has three nicknames. Which, is, which would be weird, or, or two nicknames and a real name, right? Someone has three names. I've, I've never heard of this, it's usually just two, but they say they do. Well, there's an alias, right? And so you have three people, Smith, Jones, three names, Smith, Jones, and Robinson. And you go, okay, so you have someone who's like a crook. Sometimes he calls himself Mike Jones, sometimes Mike Smith, sometimes Mike Robinson. And so if Mike Jones is Mike Smith, and Mike Robinson is Mike Smith, how is Mike Robinson related to Mike Jones? If we're just talking about them, is in the sense of being an alias for the same person. Well, Mike Jones is Mike Robinson. Right? They're all three the same person. So you can say Mike Jones is Mike Robinson, Mike Robinson is Mike Smith, <coughs> Mike Smith is Mike Jones. Right? Unambiguously. And anything you can say about one, you can say about the other, except that Sometimes he uses one, he goes by one name and sometimes he goes by another name. But is that the only way? Is identity always transitive? Right? Is it we know in math, numbers equal to the same number are equal to each other. If x is equal to y and x is equal to z, how is y related to z? They're equal. Y was equal to Z. 
But is that true of Ali G and Aura? Just know who Ali G is. This, um, Ali G is an amazingly ignorant and pompous fake um, gangster poser with his own little uh, cable show. Borat is a Kazakhstani. Um, I, Borat and Ali G have only one thing in common, otherwise they're completely different. So anything you, the only thing that you can say truly of both of them is that they're portrayed by Sasha Baron Cohen. But apart from that, they're completely, and they're human. Apart from that, they're completely different. They, you can't say what's true of Borat is not true of Sasha Baron Cohen. And if I say, sorry, it's not true of Ali G. If I say Borat is Ali G, does that make any sense at all? Would you ever say that? Would you ever say that two characters played by the same actor are the same character? You know, is Han Solo Indiana Jones? Would anyone ever say that Han Solo was Indiana Jones? No, we'd say played by the same guy. We wouldn't say they're the same. Now, we might say Han Solo is Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones is Harrison Ford. You guys remember these guys? Because this is like your parents, movies your parents went to. So, um, this is not a good rule. This is wrong. Think about the Morning Star and the Evening Star. <laughs> is it true that everything you can say about the Morning Star, you can equally truly say about the Evening Star? The Morning Star is seen when? Morning, thank you. Please don't leave me hanging, guys. <laughs> the morning star is seen in the evening, in the morning. Can you say that about the evening star? There's the evening star. It's seen in the evening. Do you ever see the e in the morning? Do you ever see the evening star in the morning? No, you don't. The morning star is seen in the east. When I gave this lecture Tuesday, I got it backwards. The morning star is seen in the east. What direction is the evening star seen in? which is actually that way. The East is that way, right. more or less. So, what you can say about the morning star, you cannot say about the evening star. Do you ever look up at the morning star and say, my God, that thing is 65, I can, I can see that that thing is 65 million miles from the star. It's, you know, I can see, I can see it's a lot closer than we are. It's about two-thirds the way uh, as uh, the distance from the sun is us. Anybody ever say that while looking at the morning star? That they can see it, something that they can see. The morning star is named for an experience we have. The evening star is named for an experience we have. You can't say the same things about both of them. The only thing they have in common is that they're seen just above the horizon in, um, in a transition period from, from between, I can't even come up with it, it's like lower the horizon and one's when the day is ending and the other's when the day is beginning. So Schaeferian identity only exists when you have the object is just alternative names for the same, exact same thing seen exact same way. But we have more objects than that. We have Ali G and Borat, who are not the same. You can't say the same things about them. Morning Star and Evening Star, you're not the same. You can't say the same things about them. How are they related? How is the Morning Star related to the Evening Star? It's the same source. The same source. The same, exp the same explanation. The same, we use the same theory to explain each one. I have a theory about why the morning star exists, and it's the same theory as why the evening star exists, because I believe that there's a planet 65 million miles from the sun, or at least an orbit inside ours, that sometimes reflects light um, from ahead of us in our orbit and sometimes from behind. You know, sometimes um, celestial west and sometimes celestial east, if that makes sense. 
And this explains why you can't, well, you, you, you know, you don't see them, you never see them in the sky at the same time. And you don't see either of them at noon, because their orbits inside. At noon, we're fa which way direction? If you look straight up at noon, are you facing towards the sun or away from the sun? Away from the sun. Actually, I, I got it wrong. Mid at noon, you're looking straight, almost straight at the sun. If you look straight up. If you look straight up at midnight, what direction are you looking? Away from the sun. Directly, almost directly away from the sun. Which means that wherever Venus is, it's behind you. Right? So the whole sky, it's behind the whole sky. You put you put your arms out and look up, right? All the darkness. Venus has to be below the horizon. So you can't see either the morning star or the evening star. So there's this theory we have which posits the existence of a big ball of rock orbiting the sun at some distance closer than we orbit the sun on, on this ball of rock. Right? And we use that theory to explain the morning star, and we use that theory to explain the evening star. Now, other experiences we have is experience of thought. Right? Talking about experiences of perception, Right. Oh, remember, Berkeley, perceptions are mental events. If I see a bright light in the thing, that's a mental event. I'm talking about sense data. I'm not talking about, hey, there's an object there and it's behaving a certain way and I don't see it. I'm saying I see something. I have perceptions. And the existence of the object is something we believe in to explain that. Remember, real world is a theory. What you have with certainty is just sense data. What you experience is sense data. It's the only thing you have direct <coughs> contact with. It's the only thing you can be certain of is sense data. Yeah. Believing in things outside your mind, outside your mental stream of consciousness, your stream of consciousness, so believing that, it's a theory. It's a very sensible theory. It's a good theory. It's a theory I, I believe in wholeheartedly. I, I rarely doubt it. Uh, in fact, I don't think I ever doubt it. I, I mean, might never doubt it. I don't think I would doubt it. But it's still a theory. Very well justified theory. Got a lot of evidence to support it. But all that evidence is sense data. So we have sense data, and we have the sense data of an external world. And our theory to explain that is that there's an external world. Right? We have all this stuff we see and feel and hear and, and taste and smell and touch and whatever. And our explanation for that is there's an external world that follows the laws of physics that has things in it like rocky big balls of rock or big balls of gas and ball, huge balls of gas that are burning with nuclear fire and, and all that stuff and we also have internal perceptions thoughts um, I have you know visual memories imagination you can imagine you, you, you know think of all the things that you can imagine that you might imagine um, right think of any thought you've ever had and our explanation for that is there's a thing we call a brain that contains neurons that is structured a certain way and the neurons work a certain way and it's exposed to hormones from glands inside and outside the brain and it's fed with blood and all that kind of stuff and this brain is doing something the neurons are firing in various patterns and that's making those thoughts that's our explanation and these things are utterly parallel there is no difference in the scientific explanation for brain activity and the scientific explanation for seeing the morning star. Schaffer is wrong about identity. He's wrong, especially wrong, about the sense of identity in phrases like the morning star is Venus, water is H2O, the mind is brain activity. He's just wrong about that. This is a bad 
criterion for identity. He made up a rule that would rule out the brain, but it rules out all of, almost all of it rules out all of science too. This is not the rule we use. It's a special rule he wants us to use just here so he can attack my brain identity theory. But if that's the rule, then water is not H2O. The morning star is not Venus. And so on. Okay, any questions about that one? All right. So... <coughs> There's a lot of arguments in philosophy that start by making up a new rule that nobody's ever used that would make no sense in any other context and say, we should use this rule here to, to attack this theory I don't like. So I'm going to talk about two more um, objections, and they should be easier to understand. Um, both of them pretty much come from Donald Palmer, the things he said in the book. He didn't say very much about them. I'm going to try and expand them. Um, instruments get better, we are going to be able to have a finer and finer grained understanding of brain activity. That we'll be able to monitor brains and see uh, different things that are going on. Um, as far as we can, uh, can tell, right, mental activity is correlated with brain activity. And the only uncertainty here is uncertainty generated by the fact that our instruments are still very crude. So, but Palmer says, well look, even if mental activity was very, very, very strongly correlated with brain activity, that wouldn't prove that the mind is making the brain. Now I want you to think about the rule that is implied here. We believe that a moving electric charge generates a magnetic field. Right. The right hand rule, you've got a charge moving along a wire this way, it makes a magnetic field this way as it goes. Right. It's the principle behind electromagnets and electric motors and generators when it goes the other way. If you put a magnetic field around a wire, it will make a moving charge. Now, if correlation doesn't prove causality, we don't know that a moving charge makes a magnetic field. Have you ever heard that? I used to hear that every once in a while. Correlation doesn't prove causality. And my answer to that would always be, well, what does? What does prove causality? What proves causality is a correlation that cannot otherwise be explained. The reason we think cigarette smoking causes cancer is that cigarette smoking is highly correlated with lung cancer and nothing else is correlated with lung cancer in anything like the same way. It's the only possible cause of it. Is that good enough to prove that cigarette co smoking causes lung cancer? Well, yes, that's what we do. That is our standard of proof we use everywhere. But Palmer says, no, you can't use it for the mind. You can't use that standard of correlation. If, if everywhere else the rule is strict correlation, strong correlation that, can't, that, that, that has no you know, strong and unique correlation, <laughs> proves causality, except when we're talking about the mind. Well, why is the mind different? Why is the mind special? Uh, I don't know. The only thing I can think of is it doesn't like mind-brain identity theory. Why wouldn't we use this rule here? We say, you know, right? 
if if this is the rule, see, rules of logic are universal. They are valid everywhere they can be applied. If a rule is not valid everywhere it can be applied, it's not a rule. That's fundamental in logic. You can't say 2 plus 2 is 4 when you're doing plumbing, but it's not 4 when you're doing elect electrical stuff. That doesn't work. Um, you can't say you need evidence to convict people uh, of fraud, but you can convict people of murder without evidence. That doesn't work. Right. Um, so, Think of this as sort of hurdles. You have a bunch of theories running around a track, and they're jumping hurdles this high. But then when mind-brain identity comes around the track, Palmer wants to raise the hurdle up here. <coughs> he wants there to be a, a different rule for mind-brain identity theory than the theory than every other scientific theory. In any, any scientific context, in any context, right, a very strong correlation that is unique, that nothing else is correlated in the right way or anything near the right way, plus Occam's razor says that this is causality. Right? And the correlation between mind and brain is astounding. Every time bits of the brain are damaged, bits of the mind go away. Um, every time the mind does something, there's a mental event, and we're able to measure the brain while it's happening, there's brain activity. Nothing else is correlated with it. And the ordinary rules of science, mind is brain. And it's very telling that you don't get arguments like this in brain science. Nobody goes to a conference of neurologists and says, look, you guys theory that neurons, neural activity makes consciousness and thought, that theory doesn't work. And they say, well, we've got all this evidence. Yes, but those evidence is just correlations, positive and negative correlations. That's not <coughs> enough. It's not enough to prove it. And the question you would ask the guys, well, what, what would be? What would prove something? What is the rule that proves something? <coughs> and he won't really have any kind of sensible answer. He might come up with something like ethereal causality, or you've got to have bridge laws. But when you ask for examples of this stuff, you're not going to get anything. It's not going to make sense. So correlation is enough. It's what we always use. We don't have this rule that Palmer wants us to use. We have a different rule in science. And we should, have, we should have that different rule in philosophy, too. We should not allow people to make claims about existence that violate standard scientific reading. Science is the paradigm. Unless there's a really good reason to make it not, and I don't see any such reason here, so, correlation objection fails because correlation, but again, because he's setting a rule that nothing else follows. It's, a, it's what they call special pleading. Right. It'd be a, think of it this way. 
someone comes into court, there's evidence, the level of evidence is the same that's convicted people a thousand times, and his lawyer says, yeah, but we should have a special rule for this guy. This guy's special. You know, um, I, I, you know, overwhelming evidence is not enough. We want it to be super overwhelming. We want it to be perfect. And the judge is going to say, no, same rules that everybody else gets. So that's my claim about the correlation objection, is that the rule that is used to establish the mind-brain identity theory, um, that, the, that the brain is causing the mind, is the same rule, the same standard of proof that we use in every other scientific theory. Now, talking of science, Palmer claimed that the mind-brain identity theory is not falsifiable. Now what falsifiable means, it's a technical term invented by a fellow called Karl Popper, or Sir Karl Popper. He was, uh, I think he was Austrian, and then he moved to England and was knighted because he was like really smart. Right. So Karl Popper um, came up with this criterion for telling whether a theory is a scientific theory. Um, Karl Popper said, Karl Popper believed, and I agreed with him, that Freudian psychology is not a scientific theory. It is not science. Um, and his criteria for that was, well, look, you describe any imaginable set of mental symptoms to a Freudian psychologist, and he will have a Freudian explanation for it. He'll be able to say, well, he hates his mother. I know. You know, it, it's, it's an Oedipus complex. It's a mani manifestation of the sex drive. He will have an explanation. And that is not true of a scientific theory. Now, I talk, earlier I talked about the being there's no cubical planets. There's never a cubical gas giant, let's say. We will not, on no solar system <coughs> in any galaxy will you ever find a cubical planet. You want to find a planet in a cube, a cubical gas giant, because gas is a fluid, and if you had a cube of fluid, a cube of gas that was the size of a gas giant, Gravity would pull it into a sphere, distort it a little bit by rotation, but it would be an oblate spheroid. It would be spheroid. It would not be a cube. And so, if I asked a physicist what would happen to physics, to the theory of gravity and, and material, fluid dynamics, if there was a cubical gas giant with nothing around it, to, to, to be distorting gravity or anything. You found a cubical jet that was actually naturally cubical. You say, well, that would prove physics wrong. If um, two pieces of normal matter repelled each other without anything being different about them, that would prove the theory of gravitation wrong. Uh, a, a square orbit of a planet would prove gra uh, Newton's gravity wrong. It would prove if we found, if we found that um, every every object in the solar system actually orbited around the uh, asteroid Ceres, that Ceres remained fixed in place relative to the rest of the universe, and everything in the um, solar system actually revolves around this tiny point, that would prove gravitation wrong. Um, there's lots of things that we can imagine that would prove gravitation wrong, that would prove various scientific theories wrong. You can't do that for Freudian psychology, so it's not science. And it, 
since it proves everything, it proves nothing, and you can't make predictions from it, it can't really help. Freudian psychology is just rubbish, frankly, and, and Freud was a git. Um, but that's, uh, that's another story. Right, so Palmer says we can't, or Palmer implies, imagine any um, conceivable, and it's conceivability that matters here, conceivable circumstances that would prove it wrong. Is this true? Is it true that we cannot imagine a set of circumstances, that we cannot come up with a story, with a narrative, with an imaginary situation, that if it was true, would mean that mind-brain identity theory was <coughs> false? How are your imaginations? Crank up the, the, the right side of your brain. Imagine something that would make where mind-brain identity would be false. I, I think this is actually easy. What if we took someone, we found someone who walked and talked and made perfect sense, who could dance, who could hold a conversation, who could remember stuff, who could solve math problems in his head, uh, could design airplanes or at least, you know, draw flames on the sides of cars, who could drive, who could do all the mental operations that any of us can do, who's fully, who's completely conscious, right, and had no brain, right? Mr. Empty Head. Imagine Mr. Empty Head. So he's got... This is head, nose, right? And then there's instead of a brain in here, there is a fluid-filled cavity. That is just water. Or Guinness. <laughs> I don't know, any, any kind of fluid, but not brain. You know, we examine his skull, we x-ray him, and we find that there's no gray matter whatsoever. It's not pressed up against the inside of the skull, as, ha as ha has actually happened. There are, there, they found a guy once who, whose brain didn't seem to be there, and then so it was like compressed up against the inside of the skull. It's like, whoa. And he could thought, walk, and talk, and think of stuff. We're talking about some guy who has no brain whatsoever. No brain whatsoever, walking, talking, thinking. Has a mind. Has a mind without a brain. What would we, if that happened, what would we conclude about mind-brain identity theory? It would have to be false. If you can have a mind without a brain, then brain doesn't make mind. Think of it, compare it to the, to the um, mind kneecap identity theory, which I, I made up. Now, you know what your kneecap is, right? The, there's a little bone called the patella here. It's also known as the kneecap. I suppose someone believes that the, the right kneecap makes the mind. And then you introduce him to someone who has no right kneecap. And you say, well, you know, his right kneecap's somewhere else. And they say, no, no, his right kneecap never existed. He was born without a right kneecap. It never formed. That would prove the theory false. And in fact, there are people who lack kneecaps who have minds, I assume. So, if it was the case that you could slice and dice the brain and there'd be no mental damage, if someone could take a bullet through the head and as long as the rest of the body heals up and there's no mental damage, then mind-brain identity theory would be proved false. Mind-brain identity theory is very falsifiable. There's all kinds of circumstances that we can imagine that would prove it false. Right? 
Palmer is talking through his hat. He it, it, it does not know, doesn't seem to even know what this means, the word falsifiable means. It means, is there a conceivable circumstance that would prove the theory false? And yes, of course there are. There are lots of circumstances that would prove it false. Remember, mind-brain identity theory is a recent theory. Aristotle thought the brain was an organ for cooling the blood. Oh, my blood's too hot. Whoa, it goes up to this thing. Here's it. Um, ancient peoples, for most of history, thought that thinking was done by an immaterial soul or a spirit, or it was done by the heart, or both. The brain does the thinking? That's a, that was a weird idea for a long time. I'm not sure. I, I think it's like maybe two, three hundred years we had the idea that the brain does the thinking. It was not a theory that anyone... But now, what we know about the brain, it's pretty clear that it's true. It would be really weird and bizarre and very unlikely if it turned out mind-brain identity theory wasn't true. And it, can, it could be proved true, but it could be proved true. It's falsifiable. Okay, that last, last three sentences made no sense. I want to go back to this. Palmer says that we can't imagine any conceivable circumstances that would prove it wrong. He says, actually, we can't imagine these circumstances that would prove it true or false. Yes, I can imagine the circumstances that would prove it true, because those are the circumstances that we're in. There's neuroscience. There is tons and tons and tons of empirical evidence that the, mind, that the brain makes the mind. And I can imagine the circumstance that would prove it false. Someone without a brain who can think. So it's falsifiable, so it's scientific, supported by evidence. It's perfectly fine. And the only way people have ever seem, seem to be able to mess with the theory right now is by changing the rules of logic and saying, OK, we use these rules of logic for other parts of science. Let's use a different rule for the mind-brain identity theory. And we'll use a rule that, proves that, that would prove every other theory wrong but we'll just use it for mind-brain identity theory? I don't think so. That's wrong. That's irrational. All right, any questions? Yes, sir? I was going to say, um, so the brain has to come first to have a mind, right? Because you have to have those, or is that kind of... Right. The, you know, uh, it's like you can't have uh, electric light without a light bulb. We can't have light without a light source. So then if you had, like, if you... Basically, if you took a computer and programmed it to mimic like imagination, which is pretty much just randomization of thought and then making like images. Out of yeah, that that we'll talk about next week in functionalism. Okay. But right, uh, um, the the obvious yeah, it's the next step, is that you if you had a machine that did everything the brain did, process the way the brain did it, and it has to be done the way the brain does it. You can make a computer to mimic thought that doesn't think, right? There's PC therapist two. Uh, there are chatbots. If you had a really well-designed chatbot, you could fool people into thinking that they're talking to a real person. And this actually has happened. There have been people. Um, there used to be a thing of, of site, websites using chatbots to uh, to talk to people, and they thought they were actually talking to human beings. They find out it's a chatbot, and they feel really violated. Um, and you can, and there's ways to make these things that have nothing to do with the way the brain processes information. So mimicking, faking thought, faking consciousness can be done, and it's obviously not the same as actually having consciousness. But on the other hand, I don't see any reason why we could not eventually given enough processing power, enough power and the will to build the machine, why we could not make a computer that would have in it uh, data structures that would, uh, structures, programs that would process data the way neurons do and have, have them hooked up in the right way to do thinking. I think we're, we're generations away from it. 
uh, it's, it's, it's 100 years away at least. But um, I don't see why we couldn't do it. All right, any other questions? All right, so on the, on the final exam, I'm going to expect you to know the logic of these exams, of these exams, uh, why, what the falsifiability objection is and why it doesn't work, what the correlation objection is and why I think it doesn't work, and I'll probably lump those in the same question. Uh, what the Schaeffer, Schaeffer's objection is and why it doesn't work, and why we have reason to think the mind-brain identity theory is true. All right. Final chance for, does anyone have a question that they're, they're saving for after I tell everyone they can go home? No one's saving a question for later, because that, that trips me up. All right, all right, thank you very much for your attention. Um,